so I guess we're ready today. Uh, just, we're just going to take questions. So fire away. All right, I guess we're done. Let's see. <laughs> we can go through the homework questions uh, or the practice exam questions, but first, why don't we just do like a general open question session? I'm confused about blah. So we have so we have uh, just like let's just say first we'll talk about spines with fixed knots. So I write down some some uh, some knots. And spines, spines with thick knots at these values, T1 through Tm. And also, let's suppose they have degree k. Then um, that's kind of the most fundamental version of a spline. And uh, we can parameterize these by the truncated power basis. Remember that looks like um, the first k plus 1 functions are just polynomials. And then the, the, the rest of the functions, so there's k plus 1 plus m of them in total. So we get one of these functions for each value of t, the knots. And it looks like um, x minus tj to the power of k, positive part. So, um, so these have the property that they're uh, polynomials on each of the intervals, t, say tj, tj plus 1. And they're continuous, and they have continuous derivatives of all orders 1 through k minus 1. That's what characterizes the spline. In fact, any such function can be written as a linear combination of these ones. So that's what it means for this to be a basis. Then a slightly different, uh, slightly different tweak on that is the natural spline. And so natural splines. The same thing with degree k and knots at t1 through tm. They're just given by the d distinction is now that um, it's a polynomial of degree k minus 1 over 2. On uh, Let's suppose these were sorted, just for concreteness, on minus infinity to t1 and tm to infinity. So the case to remember is when k is 3. So cubic natural spline is, is linear to the left of t1 and to the right of tm. And they also have a parameterization. We can parameterize them with a truncated power basis, although we didn't go through that in class. Um, so those are like regress. And so these are just splines. And then to do regression on a, uh, you know, a spline basis that's like this one, or say natural splines, we just use uh, we can just do re regression. So that's called regression splines. So that's just you know get fit a spline to training data. So we just solve a linear regression for that. We just we write down, for example, suppose you told me that you wanted a spline with knots at t1 through tm of degree 3. Then I'd write down the truncated power basis, and I'd write down their coefficients, and I'd solve for their coefficients using a least squares regression. That's what that one is. And then the only other thing we talked about in detail was smoothing splines. And these fit a natural spline. to training data, x, i, y, i. And they, the distinction is that they actually don't come with pre-specified knots. They just automatically use um, x1 through xn as the knots. 
And they also use regularization so that not only do they fit a natural spline with knots there, but they also do it subject to regularization. And in terms of the coefficients, we saw it's like an L2 type of regularization. So if, if we write down beta for the coefficients of the space of natural splines with knots at these input points, then it was the regularizer was something like beta transpose and matrix times beta. Is that? Yeah. So for natural splines, do we use the same truncated power basis, or do we just add different strings onto the function? Right. Um, yeah. So. Right. So this the space of we learned that actually natural splines. Um, so these guys have the trunk. For example, the space of splines with knots at these points of dimension of a. Uh, Degree k has dimension m plus k plus 1. And for natural spines, it's dimension m. And we saw that we can get a basis for this space by taking the trunk. On your homework, you saw that you can take the truncated power basis. And you said, like you said, put constraints on their coefficients. And uh, I'm not sure if you ever wrote out what the final basis functions look like subject to those constraints. But they look like, basically, um, uh, differences of things that look like this. So you end up subtracting off other, other, uh, other basis elements so that the final set is only, has only m things. And they, they have this constraint that they're only polynomials to the left of t1 to the right of tm. Other questions? Um, correct. It's an expectation. So we didn't actually learn that. I think we might have stated it, but we didn't prove it or anything. So if beta hat is the lasso, you know, solution, then it's the degrees of freedom of the lasso fit under uh, no real conditions except for the ones we talked about for uniqueness is the expected number of things in the active set. So it's the expected number of, if this is the active set, right, A, A is just the support of beta hat, then it's the expected number of things you found. Is that expectation over the noise or the randomness? Over the, the, over the noise. So x is considered fixed here. We may actually um, prove this later in the class. Oh, that's true. On the homework, you, you actually show this is true for the orthogonal x case, which is a, it's a nice concrete way of seeing it. We may get to proving that like later in the course, if you guys are interested. We'll do some advanced topics. So um, that level of detail you want to worry about for the midterm, first of all. But I can answer the question anyways, or at least attempt to. So the, the difference between the two is that the, um, the restricted eigenvalue result implies the cap compatibility condition. I think it's written in the notes there, that if you know the restricted eigenvalue result is true, then it implies the compatibility condition. The compatibility condition. Um, It said something like, so you guys are going to have to help me out because I don't remember exactly what it said. But it said something like, uh, is it like that? Yeah, times pi squared divided by s. Pi squared divided by s. This has to be true. For any 
data such that um, on the S components, well, that's the true, su true subset, it has one norm, sorry, on the off S components, it has one norm bounded by 3 times the one norm on the S components. The restricted eigenvalue condition um, said something like this instead. Is there, was there an S not there too? I can't remember. No, S not. Why not? And this has to be true for any beta such that um, if you look at its components outside of J, they were less than or equal to 3 times the components on J for any J with the same size as S. So this, has, this is a combinatorial condition. It's true over any possible subset of predictor variables that have the same size as your, the, kind of the truly relevant ones in the population. And because of a simple bound between the L1 norm and the L2 norm, we can actually show that this implies this. If this is true, then this implies the compatibility condition. So in a sense, the, the um, restricted eigenvalue condition is even stronger. It's kind of an even stronger thing to assume. But maybe it's more transparent because um, if we happen to know the size of the true subset, um, but not the true subset itself, it's something in principle we could check just by combinatorial checking, right? We check every possible subset of the same size as the true one. Why is this called a restricted eigenvalue condition? It's because think of the special case in which, um, think of the special case in which we take something like uh, beta j, um, you know, is something in beta minus j equals 0. So we actually just restrict all the components of beta to be 0 outside of j. That, that certainly is going to fall into this cone that we're defining here. Then in that case, you can see that actually um, this term on the left is, is exactly this. It's, it's just the L2 norm of xj times beta j squared, because x is because uh, beta is 0 outside of j. I'm just written it out like this. And we're saying that this has to be over n, or we can even move the n to the other side, has to be bigger than or equal to n times phi naught squared over s. Well, there's no s there. Um, times the L1 norm of beta squared. And if that were true, it would, it would imply something like this, um, with an s not there, just from the relationship between the L1 and L2 norms. And in fact, remember, it was 0 outside of everything on j in this special case. So this is what the bound looks like in this very special case. And you can see this is actually telling us that the, all the eigenvalues of this matrix have to be at least this big. And it's restricted in the sense that we're only looking at this matrix restricted to the columns that lie in J. So this is loosely what this is saying, although it's not exactly what it's saying because remember, beta J can still be non-zero outside of the set J. It just has to be small in some sense. Uh, there was, because I was using the relationship between L1 and L2 norms. So there was no S0 here. But when I turn this into L L2 norm, there was a an S0. So the relationship is that um, the one I'm using is like this, right? The um, For any vector, let's suppose x is a vector in Rk. I'm bound to get this wrong now, but I should probably read it off from here. I want to say that the one norm is always. I think your norm has to be square. I think the bottom is square. What's that? I think the uh, restricted eigenvalue is also the L2 norm. Yeah, thank you. That makes more sense. 
So then I was just reading it off really directly. Um, Wait, this is L2 you're saying? Yeah. And that's L1. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, the L2 norm of a vector should always be less than or equal to square root of k times the L1 norm. Is that right? Other way around. That's why I said I'm bound to get it wrong. Let's see if that makes sense here. So. I think I had it right. Um, let's just see if it makes sense here. So let's say the L1 norm over root k is bigger than or equal to the L2 norm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can you go through the subset selection and all the whole rest? Sure. Uh, we didn't really learn how to prove that, but the result was that um, If I look at the subset selection problem, right, like this, and I take uh, lambda to be, well, I think it was square root log p, but somebody who has a note should tell me whether that was right or not. Is that right on the order of that? <coughs> Nobody has the notes? I'll just keep going, and then you can tell me that's wrong or not. So that means that uh, un under some choice of lambda about that order, um, the risk of the subset selection estimator this is the, the minimizer of this problem with that value of, of lambda, whatever this was. And take the expectation over the noise with x fixed. Then um, if I look at that risk and I look at its ratio compared to the risk of the um, oracle estimator, which knows the true subset ahead of time. This is the size of the true subset, and it performs least squares in that subset. So its risk is s naught times uh, sigma squared. Then no matter what x is, or what beta naught was, so over any choice of x and any choice of beta naught, it's the true coefficients. right? And then those true coefficients were, were denoting their, the size of the support by s naught. This was um, bounded by something like log, something on the order of log p. I can't remember exactly. There's some constants here. There's like 4 log p plus, was this the right value of lambda, or was that? No square root. No square root, OK. So um, that was the result. We didn't prove it. We just said that this was what subset selection can do. And actually, not only is that true, but we also have a lower bound, which says that the minimum overall estimators of the corresponding maximum is also bigger than or equal to a constant times log p. So in, the, in that sense, it's the best we can do. You can't do anything better than that. Yeah? Should we uh, know vars for the Ah, uh, Thanks, Jisoo. You should know what it says. You don't have to know the details. We didn't go through the details. Just the, if you remember the explanation I gave about like um, you know choosing the variable that has the most correlation with the visual repeatedly, just that level of understanding. <laughs>
Kevin. Uh, in one of the homeworks, we had this problem about pricing for uh, uh, density estimation. And I think it was the bias. And I remember, is there any, is it just a mathematical trick, or is there some high level intuition on why this thing will remove the bias? Oh, yeah, it's a two liner. Uh, I know Yusu's group was very complicated. <laughs> but. Uh, should be writing little o smaller. So in other words, the difference between the two estimates is connected to the bias. So now your new estimate, which I don't know what we call it, dagger or something, is just your original estimate minus the bias. So I'm thinking of lasso is bias. Can we do some very similar trick to? No. Oh. So this the reason why this works is because we know in this particular case that the estimate is equal to the truth plus a very bias of a very special form. It's some constant times a squared oh. plus something of mean zero. You can do most linear estimators are going to have similar types of things. But this lasso of the are nonlinear estimators, things are much more complicated. At least I don't know. Is there a simple? You need to know the form of the bias, right? As a function of the lasso, say, of lambda. And that's there's not a simple way to see that. So if you know the form of the bias for something, then you could cook up something similar to that. Uh, so the proofs that we have seen uh, in lectures are always of the form that the bias is less than or equal to ch square. Uh, so uh, do we know that it will be off the order of h square and then we can write down such an equation or like is there a danger that it can go down to a lower order than h square? Well, under, so the, the very, one of the very first lectures we, we said assuming, right, that it was the, the 
derivative was Lipschitz, that the bias was of that order. We also worked on a more general expression that said, no, if it's in a more general function class, the bias had a different order. But the generic assumption that people generally make, the most common assumption, is that basically that it's twice differentiable. So as long as it's twice differentiable, the bias is going to be of order h squared. So when in doubt, you should just assume it's of order h squared. something like this in, uh, in class, but we did it more generally. I think we also talked about regression. So let's review. So why don't we just do, uh, why don't we just do part, or this question. Should we just do that? Problem four? Yeah. And so the problem said, we're going to look at the lasso estimator. And we're going to we're going to start with the KKT conditions, which Jason wrote down for you there. So it's like x j transpose y minus x beta hat uh, equals lambda times s j, where uh, s j was subgrading of the one norm. Dot with a beta in the jth component. So it's just like we, we were told it looks like this. So it's anything that's either between minus 1 and 1, beta j is 0. And otherwise, it's just equal to the sine of beta j. Um, and then the question says, assume that the, the solution beta hat is unique. And we're going to let A denote its support, or its active set. And the question asks, in the first part, part A, it says, uh, prove or derive an expression for x beta hat in terms of A and S. You may assume that xA transpose xA is invertible. So how do we do that? Um, we did this kind of thing in, in lecture. So you might remember that we can start off by writing the KKT conditions. I'm going to collect all these equations over. This is true for all j, right? I'm going to collect these equations just for the set of active variables. And I'll write them like this. Where that denotes the columns of x that are in A. So it's, I'm collecting all the columns xj for j that's in A. This denotes the just the components of S that are in A. And I can almost find an expression for x beta hat, but not quite. Um, what I first do is I just recall that since A is its active set, then x beta hat is really this x A times beta hat A, because beta hat is 0 outside of A. So none, none of the other columns matter. And now I, I, this is a linear system that I can solve for beta A. And I we even were told that x A transpose x A is invertible. So when we solve this linear system, it looks like this. Um, lambda SA. 
And now we want an expression for x beta hat. Well, what's x beta hat? Remember, it's just x a times beta a, because beta a is beta is 0 outside of a. And then that, we'll just get that from multiplying this by, a, by x a. Now the same, the same thing here, x a transpose y <coughs> minus lambda s a. So that's part A. Questions about that part? Part B then says, um, let's assume that A is a constant, and S is a constant in that expression. It's not true, because A depends on Y, really. And so it is SA. That's the active set that the lasso determines. This is the signs of the active variables. Those depend on y, right? It's part of the feature of the lasso that it chooses um, which variables to include in the model. But it says let's assume that they're fixed. And it asks us to derive. the degrees of freedom of the lasso fit. So what's the degrees of freedom of the lasso fit? What's the degrees of freedom of any, of any estimator? It's what you get by taking 1 over sigma squared times the trace of the covariance matrix of that thing with y. Right? So this definition of degrees of freedom. This is the same, same way of stating it, or equivalent way of stating it, is that it's the sum of the covariances of the ith fitted value with the ith observation divided by sigma squared. I just wrote it in matrix form here. And OK, let's just use this. If x and a and, a and s a are fixed, then this is just 1 over sigma squared times the, well, actually, I haven't assume they're fixed yet, but let's write out what this is first. It's um, this matrix. I'm going to call this matrix H sub A, so the hat matrix over the A block. So it's that matrix I'm calling H sub A. It's just H sub A times Y plus a constant. C is just going to be this matrix times lambda times SA. So this is always true, actually. I just, you know, C is just that other term, H is that matrix. But I couldn't generally evaluate this covariance if I wasn't assuming they're fixed, because this actually itself is random. A is random, and C is random. But if we assume they're fixed, like the problem tells us to, it's, it's easy enough. We can just pull out the covariance, right? Because uh, pull out the linear transformation h, because covariance is linear. This is a constant if we assume they're fixed, so it doesn't, it doesn't appear at all. We can just get rid of it. And so assuming they're fixed, right? this is equal to 1 over sigma squared times the trace of h a times the covariance of y with itself. And um, in the problem setup, that's just sigma squared times the identity, because I have iid errors, right? So that's, this is the sum of the variance. So the variance of <coughs> y's. And what does it end up being? It ends up just being the trace of h a. Okay, But still remembering that, that, that uh, a is assumed to be fixed, what is this? It's the uh, trace of x a times x a transpose inverse x a transpose. And one of the properties we know about trace is that it's, uh, it's cyclic. So I can always um, cycle the order of the matrices inside the trace. So I'll just do that. I'll move this xa over to here, and the trace will remain unchanged. So that's um, trace of xa transpose <coughs> xa times xa transpose xa inverse 
that's the identity, but it's the identity matrix of length A. Of a, it's a identity matrix of the same dimension that A is. Right? So if A has length K, this is the identity matrix of, si of dimension K. And so this in general, what's the trace of the identity matrix of length K? It's just K. So this is, ends up just being the size of A. Whatever the size of A was, that's what that trace will be. And that's the poor man's proof that the loss of those degrees of freedom is A, is the size of A. Right? It's not actually rigorously true. And I said to Kevin earlier that the answer is the expected value of A. But that's, if we assume they're fixed, then it's easy enough just to arrive at this answer. Um, but then the last part of the question said, what other regression method has uh, the same degrees of freedom? Well, the answer like lies actually in these steps here somewhere. For example, it, it you could see it from any of these steps, but just look at look at this step here. What is this? That's just that's just doing regression on the fixed subset A. Right. In other words, A sub A is the hat matrix if A was fixed. So the, the last part of the, the question you can answer it by saying. The same degrees of freedom as doing a regression of y on x a with a fixed. Or really, it's the same degrees of freedom as doing y on any subset of variables that has the same size as a. It doesn't have to just be these, right? Any subset of variables. Say, say A had length 10. But if I do regression of Y on any subset of 10 variables, it always has degrees of freedom of 10. So that was just the answer. Uh, which part? Only true. I meant linear. It's a linear regression. Any linear regression of Y on a subset of, say, 10 variables will have 10 degrees of freedom. Yeah, so doing linear regression, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Problem three. So that the risk of k-means clustering strictly decreases with k population. Oh, well, if we look at... Uh, One mean. Let's just, let's just let's suppose you draw it as if it's on the real line. So the function is you pick a center, and what we're evaluating, again, let's start with just one mean, and this is just x, the expected value of x minus the center squared. So our, the risk function looks like this. And of course, k means means that in the first step, our, for let's say k equals one, we've chosen this to minimize this, right? So let's suppose we've done that. In fact, for k, k equals one, what is the minimizer? The main, right? So that, that one's easy. Uh, now I want to show that when I do add another center, the risk must go down. In fact, it doesn't even have to be the, so we're now going to consider, the, the claim is that if I now look at the risk over for k equals 2, so that's, that's the minimum over all c1 and c2. <coughs> and this is x. So we, we choose the best centers. But I'm going to show you now that I'm going to make the risk smaller even before I do the minimum. And hence, the minimum also has to make it smaller. And just put a, put a second center anywhere. And then this function, when I, what we're doing is taking the distance to the closest one. So the function looks like this. So you can see that the thing that you're taking the expected value of, as soon as you add a second center, is strictly less than the thing you just 
strict, the expected value of a minute ago. And so it's already, the risk is already strictly smaller. And of course, that's true even if I didn't minimize over C1 or C2. Adding any center at all automatically reduces the risk. That's why there's no bias bearing straight off of clusters, because that the risk itself is strictly decreasing as you add more and more centers. Unlike when you're doing regression, where if you add more and more things, the empirical risk might go down, but the prediction risk, you know, there's a bias bearing straight off. For unsupervised learning, we don't have that. Is that good? Rigorous. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, I'll write it like this. Let's put it over here. Let's define. So for a vector of center C, let's define, first of all, let's call it um, Z C. making this statement precise, that I have started with a function, I have a second function, which is less than or equal to it, and strictly less than or equal to it, over a ball. And so finally, the, I would say the minimum over all vectors of length k plus 1, Let's call it. Uh, all right, let's see what 
that's what we're interested in. So let's call it this R of C star, which may not be attained at a unique C star, but at least at some C star. And if we do the same thing for the empirical, we, we get the empirical risk, which is what we use for KV and we get C hat. And what we can show is that the true risk of the thing we found from k-means is less than or equal to the risk of the best one plus something of order, let's say k over root n. It's not the c's that are close, it's the risks. But we didn't prove that. That's something we'll prove when we get to the section on concentration measure. Let's check how we're doing on time. I guess we're, oh, no, no we, we go to? 2.50. Two, we still lost time. Uh, we'll get to that later in the course, but I'll just tell you what it is quickly for your curious, which is just that the reason why classification risk can be very small in high dimension, despite the fact that the minimax regression risk is poor in high dimension, is the Sivakov noise condition. So remember that the optimal classifier, if this is, if this is the mean of y, Y is binary, and this is the regression function, the mean of Y and the X. And as you know, this is the regression function, let's say it looks like this. Then the optimal classifier, right, is to classify zero here and one here. And the idea of simple compromise is that you can estimate the regression function poorly and still classify well. That's the way to think about it. Why? Well, it requires two conditions. Notice in this example, I have that we're crossing the boundary fairly quickly. And what I'm not showing you here, though, is this is the, what I'm showing you is the regression function. Of course, x is random. It has its own distribution. Let's call it p of x. And the other assumption is that, let's suppose p of x doesn't put a whole bunch of probability right at the decision. So if the probability around the decision boundary is not too small, is not too big, then you can see you're not going to make many mistakes, right? Because most of the time you're either over here or over here. And even if you've estimated the regression function poorly, you're still going to classify well. And so there's a high dimensional version of this. That's what the Sipikov noise condition says. And we'll, we'll probably have a probably have a class or something mentioned this at some point, maybe in the minimax lectures. <coughs> That's the, this thing called the Sipikov noise condition, which just says that we, that the probability that you're right, right close to the decision boundary is small. In that case, you can show that you get very, very small classification risk even in high dimensions. That's why it's easy to classify digits, for example, for that, which are technically very high dimensional. But that's getting ahead. So we actually, is it mentioned it in the notes already? Surprise. So, you know, the notes, of course, cover more than we cover in the lectures. So, you don't have to know civic optimism, so we didn't mention it yet in the, in the lectures. Can you review how to sample from a Jewishly posterior? Oh, yes. Uh, I realize that's. So, let me just say there's no questions about non parametric phase in the test. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So now let me ask you, would you still like me to do that? No. <laughs> I just want to make sure we use our time efficiently. Can we do problem two? Problem two? <laughs> it's a Ryan problem. <laughs> Okay.
problem last year, so I have to remember how to do it. Um, okay, so we have. We have these samples, um, and we're saying, saying that let's assume that yi is actually equal to pl of xi <coughs> for some polynomial pl of degree l. So in other words, uh, just pictorially, it's like we're observing um, the exact evaluations of some polynomial function. Say some cubic or something, or some L. And then the, the question asks you to prove that the first part that, um, let's suppose we, we build uh, a, an estimator f hat based on these training samples um, using kth order local polynomial regression. Where k is bigger than or equal to L. And it says prove that, um, I want to prove that the fit we get back is exactly the polynomial the fitted values we get back. So how do you, how, let's, let's uh, pose this as a discussion question. How, how do you start this problem? The hint says write out the definition of f hat as an optimization problem at an arbitrary point x. What would you guys do? This, this f hat would minimize that function. Right, yeah, so f hat minimizes f hat of x is going to be um, right some combination of um, right we'll call it a x uh, j x to the power of j so it's some polynomial of degree k where j equals zero to k. <coughs> where these weights are chosen to minimize the regression loss. So where, um, you know, that, that thing is chosen according to the following problem, minimize over all coefficients a um, right, yi minus the sum of aj xi to the power of j, j equals 1 to k, times, uh, it's actually a weighted, right? Because we weight this by the kernel kernel weights, kx minus xi over h, sum from i equals 1 to n. So a hat is chosen according to this problem. OK. Um, so the question is, what, what solves that problem now? PL. Right, so PL is, so let's suppose PL is, um, you can write PL of X as, you know, we'll call it something else, uh, B, J, X to the J, J equals 0 through K. It's just some polynomial of degree, actually it's degree, degree L, excuse me. And now the insights notice that no matter what kernel we use, no matter what X we're at, I can always make this 0. Right? I can make this exactly 0 by just choosing the a's uh, to be b0 through bl, and then whatever's left over, if k is um, you know, bigger than l, I don't have to use any higher order terms, I can always make this 0. 
by choosing uh, the a's to be whatever the coefficients were for that polynomial. That's as small, this regression loss is always non negative, so that's as small as this can ever get. So saying that the solution is to just choose the weights according to what this polynomial PL had, and therefore um, this thing is equal to the sum of j equals 0 through L of write bjx to the j, which is just whatever the polynomial was evaluated at x. <coughs> So that's reassuring, right? It says that if we do, were to run local polynomial smoothing here with a degree that's higher than the polynomial degree of L, then we would just get back the true polynomial. Yeah? Yeah, that's easier, right? So it's actually a zero. Um, Criterion value. So yeah. Okay. Um, part B. Are any other questions about that part? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess in this argument we can find PL is one of the solution to the minimization problem. But how can we prove that it is unique? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the kernel weights. So it would be unique. So this is getting into something that's maybe not quite what we learned in class, but we need to, we would need to prove that. Um, and, and in fact, if we go over.